Okay, so we are excited to be here today to present our intro to teletherapy webinar. This is the first in a four part series. So we plan on doing these every couple of months. So you'll wanna keep an eye out for that. Um, today, you're gonna to walk away with an introduction to teletherapy. We're gonna talk about terms related to teletherapy and find evidence-based practice and talk about evidence-based practices for teletherapy. Um, we are going to have the main instructional portion of the workshop, and then we will follow up with some time for a Q&A. And towards the end of the workshop, you will be given instructions to complete the webinar survey and the post-workshop exam. And in doing that, that will make you eligible to um, receive that certificate of attendance that if you want to put that towards your CEUs, you can do so with your um, local agencies. Just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Be sure that you have that participant worksheet available so that you can follow along with us and we will put a link to that in the chat box. Um, again, use that chat box to comment or ask questions. We will stop it a few times to ask um, to answer those questions. And we also want you to respond in the chat to some of the uh, things in the conversations that we're going to have today. So use that chat box. Um, we also want you to know that you can turn on closed captioning for this webinar. So there is a closed captioning button at the bottom of the Zoom screen that will enable that function for you. We are recording this today and um, it will be available for on-demand viewing um, in a few days. So if you were not able to download that participant worksheet earlier, um, we will have just added that link to the participation um, worksheet in the chat and you can follow along. There's some areas to take notes and um, write in some answers on that as well. So to get the most out of this workshop today, please use that participation worksheet. Um, we really try to tailor that so that you're able to have something to take away from this. And also it will be very helpful when you're doing your post test. Um, also, be active in the discussions in the group chat. We'd love to hear from you and, and love to hear your questions and kind of your thoughts um, as we're going along. So to start building that community, let's get to know each other a little bit. Um, first off, if you are not a part of our clinician community here at Iluma, um, just a little bit about who Iluma is. Um, Iluma was founded in 2011 by our current CEO, CEO Jeremy Glauser. At Iluma, we are on a mission to provide better support for schools so that you can create more success stories with students. Iluma connects students and educators with clinicians who care, and we also provide software solutions to support mental health, speech therapy, OT, PT, and school psychology. Now a little bit about us, the, the presenters. Today, Melissa Torres is in that chat um, box for you to help monitor that, and um, she can also help and ask or answer any questions about any technical, or if you don't have the um, link, she can put that back in there for you as well. My name is Cami Bible. Um, I'm an occupational therapist. I've been an OT for 25 years, and I've worked in pretty much every setting that you can work in as an OT. I've done inpatient rehab, acute care, SNF, home health. Um, but the last um, pretty much over half of my career, I have been working in the schools. I'm working in teletherapy. Um, I started in teletherapy in 2015. So I had been doing that for quite a while. And I worked as a contractor with Enuma prior to coming to my current role on our clinical services team. Hello, everyone. I'm Paula Morrison, and I've been a school psychologist for about 25 years now, both in the brick and mortar setting and most recently as a remote contractor for Enuma. My background is in early childhood education, and I've also worked with adults with disabilities at the university level. So I've served the entire spectrum of disabilities from early childhood to adulthood. Welcome. Hey guys, thanks for being with us today. I'm Sarah Plunkett. I've been a speech language pathologist for 15 years. Um, like Cami, I have experience in various settings. Um, pretty much everyone you can work in as a speech therapist as well acute care, inpatient, outpatient rehab, home health, skilled nursing, um, public school settings in person, and also teletherapy. I did contract with Iluma for two years as a clinician before transitioning to my role as a clinical services team member. 
Thanks for being with us today. Yeah, we are really excited to have you here. So we're gonna put up a couple of polls here um, and we'd love for you to um, participate in those. So you'll see some um, questions popping up there. This first one is, um, we'd love to know a little bit more about your discipline. And then we'll, sh we'll share these as well. We had to do things a little bit differently today. Um, we had an overwhelming response to this webinar series, and we typically will hold these as more of a meeting where we can all see each other. But because of um, the response, we um, had to change this to a webinar so that we could manage the number of attendees a little bit better. So there's that first, um, first information there on uh, what we are. So we have a lot of... Um, providers with us today. So speech therapists, some school psychologists, OTs, and mental health providers. So that's really exciting. And the and next one that we're going to have. Oh, we'd like to go ahead polling. and find out where everyone is working too. So I, Cami, I think you have another poll for us. I do. Yeah. Let me get back to these here. All right. Great. Great. Public schools, charter schools, and a private school. Welcome. And what grades are we working with? This one going. Oops. All right. Are you seeing that third one there? Maybe I have to in this other one here. Let me try this one more time. Yes. Well, that poll has been launched. Can you guys see question three, poll? Are you guys seeing that I on your see, end? I, I don't see the third no. poll. Yeah, it's I not letting me. Just saw the. Up. Okay. Oh, there we go. I got to stop sharing this first one. There you go. All right, here we go. Question three What are your grades? Like they have a good mix here. Yeah, primary, middle, a little bit of pre-K. Welcome, pre-K. Teletherapy with pre-K is fun. <laughs> yeah. And some high school. Here's the results of that one. All right. And lastly, we'd love to know about your knowledge of teletherapy. Great. Great. Awesome. Yeah, Looks so like a good mix have, there too. Yeah, it's a little in the middle there and then um, Welcome to those of you who are brand new to teletherapy. This is going to be mm -hmm. um, a perfect starting course for you. All right. Well, before we get started, we have a few things to go over. As Cami mentioned earlier, this is the first of a four part series of our telepractice boot camp. This is an introductory level webinar series on school based teletherapy. All presenters here are affiliated with eLUMA Online Therapy Services, a provider of school-based teletherapy services. The presenters do not endorse nor receive any compensation from any products or services included in this presentation. And if you are attending live and complete the course survey and the post-test, you will receive a certificate of attendance and receive a one-hour CEU available for licensing authority approval. So here's what we're going to learn today. You can find these outcomes listed in your handout. And as an engaged participant, this is the knowledge you will walk away with at the end of the workshop. You'll be able to define three key terms related to teletherapy. 
you will describe two examples of synchronous versus asynchronous teletherapy methods. And you will be able to summarize evidence-based practices for teletherapy. So let's get started. We have a lot of material to cover today and we wanna make sure that we have time to cover all of it and answer any questions you may have. Let's start with some key terms in teletherapy. These are the key terms we're gonna to discuss today and we will go through each one of these in more depth. So we're gonna talk about telehealth versus teletherapy, telepractice sessions and also evaluations, various platforms, digital assets or materials, asynchronous versus synchronous sessions, on-site versus homeschool, also bandwidth, encryption, and digital literacy. So we'll jump right in with telehealth versus teletherapy. The CDC defines telehealth as a service that uses video calling and other technologies to help you see your doctor or other healthcare provider from home instead of at a medical facility. Telehealth may be particularly helpful for those older adults with limited mobility and also for those living in rural areas as they will have the opportunity to see and also talk to their doctors from home. The telemedicine and telerehabilitation service area began providing remote or mobile health services through devices at patients' homes that would gather and store data to relay to the healthcare physician. Telepsychiatry and teleneuropsychology services were being provided as early as 2015. The various types of virtual services can be confusing, so we're going to focus on school-based teletherapy services for this webinar today. Teletherapy services can include mental health, behavior support, speech, occupational, and physical therapies. As early as 2015, practitioners in the medical field began using remote devices to monitor patient health, as we mentioned. Research involving teleneuropsychology assessments were also noted as early as 2015. School-based speech and language services begin within the schools as early as 2011. The many benefits of teletherapy services include efficiency, greater access to high quality services, reduced waiting time, and consistent reliable support services within the school environment. And this decreases caregiver transportation demands as well. So now we're gonna start, we'll test our knowledge at various points during the webinar today. We'll start with our first question here. We're gonna test on a true or false, telehealth and teletherapy are interchangeable terms. Great, and the correct answer to that is false. All right. For a successful telepractice session, these are a few considerations to take into account when beginning your practice. Wi-Fi and internet capability are very important. It's important to understand the limits of your service based on the demands of streaming, which is the bandwidth of your internet. For example, if your internet speed cannot sustain video streaming of several videos at one time, you may need to make sure that only one device in your household is streaming when you are in a session. So if you have a bunch of teenagers in your house while you're trying to do sessions, then there's a good chance that unless you have a really high bandwidth, you're gonna run into some problems with streaming. High-speed internet is optimal for telepractice and will help avoid slow or those glitchy sessions that you may have. You will also want to make sure that you have a backup plan um, when, if your router or modem will go down. Um, as teletherapists previously 
Um, this can happen frequently, whether you're in a place that has lots of storms or someone's working in your neighborhood. Um, it's it's definitely going to happen at some point. So you want to make sure that you have um, a backup situation. You can use a hotspot from your phone or something along those lines. Um, you may uh, not have as great connectivity as you normally would if you were um, logged into a modem, but at least you would be able to either participate or um, let someone know that you were having trouble. So along the lines of Wi-Fi and internet capability is the importance of encryption. The process of encryption provides a safeguard against someone else accessing electronic data from you or the client. So utilizing a platform that is HIPAA and FERPA compliant will help ensure that your compliance in protecting student data is there. When choosing a platform or a subscription level, it's recommended that you choose one that provides encryption. And we will talk um, about this a little bit more through this webinar series. It's also important to note that if you are working for a company, um, that you would want to use their platform as it would um, follow these guidelines as well. To maintain confidentiality during a session, be aware of your surroundings and those of your client. It's helpful to send the client or student a tip sheet on how to prepare for your session so that they are aware of those expectations. For example, ask the student to be prepared to wear headphones, choose a private location so not at a Starbucks, and minimize any distractions. You'll want to pay attention to your room configuration and your background as well. Lighting and visual distractions um, can cause issues with um, connecting with your student. And you also want to make sure that your student has good lighting, quiet surroundings, and minimal distractions as much as possible. Video appearance is important, whether the session is asynchronous or synchronous. So try to choose neutral colors, um, neutral patterns for clothing. Um, again, make sure that that lighting is good, especially if you're doing um, something that's very detail oriented, like speech therapy. You'd want to make sure that you have a good view of your student and they of you. Check for shadows or features being washed out by light that's too bright from windows. You also want to make sure that audio volume is sufficient and check for any sound delays or echoing. So we have our next check your knowledge uh, question coming up. Sorry, let me go back here. That's the wrong one. We want our <laughs> Sorry, these are kind of tricky sometimes. They have to be each individual lessons here and in that one. Okay. Okay. Um, it looks like you guys are ahead of the game, though, on those yeah. responses. I love it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. Sorry. Well, go ahead and um, in the chat, put in there um, your answer to this question. Bandwidth refers to the physical size of the modem, the level of internet subscription service, the maximum capacity of the wired or wireless communication link, or the inability to view or upload photos. Which of those um, is the best answer? So you can put one, two, or three on that one. Great. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. All right. <clears throat> and we have one more question here as well. Which location provides an optimal location for a virtual setting? Would you choose a coffee shop, a school cafeteria, a kitchen, or a private quiet location with minimal distractions? Awesome, that's great. Great job, everybody. You definitely wanna make sure you have that quiet location. I've definitely seen kids um, in a school cafeteria. I've seen for OT kids in a moving car um, and it can be very difficult. So it happens sometimes, but it is nice if you can um, provide that education ahead of time to make sure that they are um, in, in a place where they can receive the best therapy. Okay, if there are any questions, um, please put those in the chat at this time. We will go ahead and, and move forward, but as we're going through this next section, we will uh, answer any questions in the chat that you might have.
All right, so now that you've chosen your secure platform, it's time to schedule your session. Uh, several practitioners will utilize apps such as Calendly or Google Calendar Invite, maybe MS Teams, or, or even just an email. When you are sending a link for your session, be certain that the link is kept confidential and sent directly to the student or the facilitator. Do not post on social media or any social media groups or a public website. The link to your virtual therapy room should be sent directly to the student or facilitator. It's important to follow any school or contract company policies and procedures regarding client communication of information related to therapy sessions and scheduling. It's also helpful to explore various online games and activities, maybe some prompts for student breaks or warmups. Some platforms may already have access to these interactive games, but you wanna look at the use of the virtual therapy rooms as well and, and all other discussion prompts. Um, it's helpful to begin a session with an engaging activity as well as providing breaks based on the student's age and ability to attend to the session. When you're assessing a student via a virtual platform, make sure your assessment meets the equivalent standards for teleassessment. There are digital assessments out there and it's important to know that these should not be altered in any way and must be accessed by the test publisher. So don't scan, screenshot, or create your own digital version of a standardized assessment as this will invalidate your scores. Only the test publisher can provide you with a digital assessment as it is formatted in a specific way to maintain standardization. You can refer to the test publisher's website for their telepractice norms, their resources and their guides, and the availability of their digital assessments. It's also important to practice and set up your environment for a smooth session. If you are conducting an assessment, plan ahead and make sure that your student has all or any of the response booklets that are needed. Make sure that your test record forms, your digital assets, timers, audio files are all prepped ahead of time and ready on your desktop. And it's helpful to run a practice session with a colleague prior to conducting your session. You should be very familiar with your test materials prior to con conducting an evaluation. The test publishers may also offer additional information on test setup. In some cases, you may be working with a facilitator or e-helper, so it's recommended that you work with that person to prior to the session and outline any expectations you may have. So let's test that knowledge. Test publishers will allow you to take a screenshot of a stimulus book and screen share. True or false? Looks like um, got everybody in. All right, I think so. Let's share those results. All right, and the correct answer is false. You should not take screenshots of those stimulus books. Okay. And the next test your knowledge question is, the facilitator can administer the test materials for the clinician. True or false? All right, let's share the results here. The correct answer there is false as well. All right. So now we're going to talk a little more specifically about those virtual platforms. While there are platforms that offer a free service, oftentimes that free service only allows for a certain amount of time or a certain amount of sessions. So you want to take the time to compare plans on virtual platforms, as well as looking at safety features and settings. For Zoom, there are various levels of services, and we do recommend that you choose the security level that ensures HIPAA and FERPA compliance. End-to-end -end encryption assures that your information is not being accessed by someone else, 
and does keep your communication secure. Make sure your platform is updated before your session. When you are hosting, you can utilize the waiting room feature to ensure the right people are waiting to be let in. You can also block the entry of others who are outside your approved group. You can disable the audio, video, and chat features of others in groups if needed. Zoom offers additional safety features on its website, and those are listed on your participation worksheet. Google Meet also utilizes encryption that uh, secures FERPA and HIPAA related information. This platform utilizes the Google Calendar for invites, so just be sure that you're on the right Google Calendar with scheduling. I know many of us um, have more than one Google account, so you want to make sure you have the right one there. You can set up a meeting code as you can in Zoom. However, there may not be a waiting room feature available with Google Meet. Only users on the calendar invite can access the platform, so just be sure you've got correct email addresses there as well. Sharing and annotation capabilities are limited with Google Meet. And then MS Teams has groups and channels as Zoom does. Uh, conversations can be held within these channels. You can also call in participants. There is very tight integration with uh, Microsoft products, which might be challenging for some Mac users. It appears to have greater usage for collaborative work, um, things like messaging, team meetings, shared notes, et cetera. So this platform is less likely used for you know, the therapy sessions, but more for team group work or meetings. And now we can test our knowledge of this information as well. Which of the following virtual platforms are most commonly used for teletherapy sessions? I think you guys already had a pretty good start earlier. Yeah. Yeah. And there are, you can choose, um, I think you can do multiple mm -hmm. answers here as well. Yeah. All right. Great. Yeah. Zoom is, I've used Zoom and Google Meets both um, for therapy, and I definitely prefer Zoom just with those sharing capabilities. Mm -hmm. So, true. Digital assets are the digital or electronic form of an assessment, activity, or any materials that would otherwise be in printed formats. For standardized assessment materials, it is important to make sure that you're only using the test publisher's digital assets because they are specifically formatted for digital use. And using any other digital assessments without test publisher authorization would be against ethical and legal practices, but it would also invalidate those standardized scores. Outside of assessments, all other materials have quickly been gaining ground. I know when I first started doing teletherapy um, in 2015, there was hardly anything out there, especially for OT, and I was making all of my own PDF and Google slide decks and things like that. And, and since the pandemic, we've seen um, an explosion of things on Teachers Pay Teachers websites. There's you know OT sites, SLP sites. Um, YouTube videos for mental health and um, social stories and things like that. So um, it's been really amazing to see what um, is new and out there. Um, people are still creating their own templates and activities for that digital use. And when you are creating your own activities, you want to make sure that you take into consideration how your student is going to be viewing those materials. So for example, um, sometimes you will have students or clients joining your room from a phone or a tablet and things may be formatted a little bit differently than what you, it was originally intended for. There are also some really great social media groups that share resources and materials and virtual platforms such as Zoom and Google Meets have started offering virtual games which are embedded into those plat platforms. Some are free and some are paid, um, but also national organizations such as ASHA, AOTA, and ASCA have some references for digital materials that may be helpful to you. We're going to go through a couple of case studies for different disciplines um, just to kind of give you a teaser of some of the things that we are going to be talking about in depth in um, the third webinar in this series, um, where we'll really talk about um, getting into assessments and sessions. But for example, um, if I had an OT student, um, a six-year-old boy with some handwriting concerns, his handwriting is illegible, um, his grasp isn't functional, and he displays poor letter formation. Um, he was approved uh, 
did qualify for special education and OT. And so we wrote some goals for letter formation and fine motor endurance. These are just a few of the uh, digital materials that I might use in a session. There's some great videos on YouTube, and this is an example of a handwriting warm up from the OT closet, which is on YouTube. Um, it goes through different um, finger exercises to, and some kind of fun things to get the students started in their session. They love to watch videos because it's something different than just my face every time. Um, and so being able to show some um, toys and examples via video is, is really great. Next, I might work on a letter formation lesson. Um, this is an example of the, an interactive digital teaching tool from Handwriting Without Tears. But there are also some great YouTube videos of letter formations or digital um, PDFs and slides that you can find on Teachers Pay Teachers or other sites. Um, and then after um, we would do the letter lesson, I might um, have some paper that I had sent over previously. Um, and then I went to have the student practice writing. So if you do some pre-planning and can send if there's some specialized paper that you might use, send that on over. And then finally, I would wrap up with a game. Um, for example, here's a few fun games from PBS Kids. Most of them are, are pretty fun, but they can also be um, good for turn taking and practicing things like that during your session. So as far as uh, speech is concerned, this uh, particular case study involves a kindergarten student uh, receiving speech language services. So um, this is a five-year-old student with articulation and language needs. Um, he was evaluated for school-based speech language services, was found to have difficulties with K and G sounds, as well as some language issues like categorizing like items and following directions. His speech affects his intelligibility within his classroom, and he also has difficulty following instructions from his teacher. So we're gonna consider how we might address the student's needs through teletherapy. And I always like to start sessions just as you would in person, you know, introducing the activity for the day, uh, reminding students of the goals we're addressing in therapy. Um, books, games, and picture scenes are really great for targeting multiple goals. There's a variety of ways to do this. As Cami mentioned, you know, we've got YouTube videos that can do some of, you know, the favorite stories and things like that. There's a lot of different platforms, you know, you can create your own games or there's a lot of different um, ways to incorporate games within a session. Um, picture scenes as well. Uh, this is just an example. I know we all probably remember Highlights Magazine from the dentist office or somewhere like that, but they actually have a website um, and it's great. They've got games, they've got activities. Um, they even have a joke section, you know, that a lot of kids really enjoy. So this hidden pictures activity is perfect for working on articulation and language goals. Students click on that big picture and they're searching for hidden items. So articulation students are able to practice their sounds once they find, you know, these items, use them in, you know, at sentence level or uh, whatever their goals might be. Language students can also address various goals here. Of course, you know, following directions. Um, also, you know, grouping like items together with that categorization goal, as we mentioned in our case study example. And in the area of mental health, our case study is Sandra, who's a 10-year-old student who was referred to the school counselor due to a recent panic attack at school. Now, the administrators and her teacher are aware of some changes at home and at school. She has a positive circle of friends, and there is no disciplinary history. She became unusually quiet and isolated until she experienced a panic attack during math class. So her classroom teacher referred her to the MTSS team for social emotional interventions. And as a result, the MTSS team decided to refer to the school counselor and a school counselor or mental health provider may opt to use a, a cognitive behavior therapy approach, which is commonly used in teletherapy. And this would help Sarah understand her feelings of stress and anxiety and how her body may react to that. Um, through a series of lessons and helping her understand that connection between her brain and her body. They may also use this app like a calm um, to help her breathe deeply and relax. Um, there are sites such as castle.org. It's a center on PBIS that can provide useful lessons. 
Um, as Cami mentioned, since the pandemic, there has been a boom in digital assets, whether they're worksheets or games or videos. For those of you who are creative and tech savvy, you can create your own videos and, and worksheets through Canva. Um, for example, this deep breathing exercise video was created in Canva and it helps teach uh, deep breathing at uh, Council 4. Um, so a therapist may choose to start a session or end a session using this deep breathing technique. And by teaching Sandra how to recognize and understand these feelings of anxiety, she can help Sandra discover strategies to help manage that anxiety. So we'll take a break here. And if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Yeah, let us know if you have any questions or thoughts. We'd love to hear those. Um, we'll keep going on though. We can take a, take a break to answer any of those questions if we need to. If you'd rather put them in the Q&A, you can also do that as well. And we will see those privately. So now we'll move on to a discussion of asynchronous versus synchronous here. Asynchronous communication is when information is exchanged or gathered at a separate time. An example of this would be sending an assignment to the client to complete on their own time. Then the client would send it back at a later date for review. Another example might be an independent study or an online study course. An instructor can upload assignments, videos, uh, maybe lectures for students to review at their own time and no scheduling is required here. An example of an asynchronous session would be an online class that's recorded by the instructor and available for you to access at any given time. These may also include emails, chats, discussion boards, or recorded videos. Synchronous, however, is live real-time interactions, just like this webinar. These types of sessions require scheduling and prior preparation for any tasks given to the client. Telemedicine and teletherapy or telerehabilitation are all examples of synchronous sessions. Communication is live and interaction takes place in real time. And so we'll move into an example here just, you know, to give us a little um, more reference. This is just a basic example of the difference in asynchronous and synchronous sessions. And here you can see how the session changes just a little, you know, based on the format, but it still really aligns with the student's goals. So for asynchronous, we might have a high school pragmatic student and they're assigned a video clip to review. Take notes on different interactions, maybe um, involving turn taking, on topic responses, or asking follow up questions. The SLP would review the notes and offer recommendations. But for synchronous, uh, the high school pragmatic student, again, is gonna log in to their regularly scheduled session. They might watch the video clip with their SLP and they're gonna identify those goals uh, just as in the asynchronous session, but they'll just identify those goals in real time with the SLP within that video. The session will continue with independent practice of goals with their uh, SLP following the video. So we want to pause and reflect here. Uh, this is on your participation worksheet. We love to hear how could you perform asynchronous and synchronous activities within your discipline? Um, you know, we'd love to sh hear you uh, share what you come up with in the chat. If you want to type a few things in there, we'd love to hear that. But we'll take a few moments for you to reflect on that. While you guys are writing some of those things down, we did have a few questions come in through the Q&A. Um, one question is about bandwidth issues and if there's like a certain provider that's better to use. So providers are going to be different all over the country. And I know in my particular area, I'm in Kansas, I'm in the Midwest, we have probably three different providers that I could have gone with. But um, what I like to do is if, if you log on to each of their um, websites, you can kind of see the different tiers that they have. Um, I work from home, you know, I've done teletherapy, I'm in meetings all day through eLoma. And I actually have um, one gig of um, internet, the gig internet through that I have available here through, a, it's a local Midwest company. Um, and that works well for me. We also, you know, my husband does a lot of streaming. We stream everything in our home um, from TV, 
um, to in our, my daughter's home from college. So that works really well for us. But I do recommend kind of looking into the different providers in your area and those different tiers. They'll usually be able to tell you, you know, what tier works best for things. Um, it, you know, if you're able to go with what they might say, the, the video gaming streaming um, tier is usually pretty safe because that's usually a pretty robust one. Um, the other question, Paula, I don't know if you want to answer this one. The question is, are individual counseling sessions most preferred in teletherapy and what would a group session look like? Oh, um, typically they are one-to-one, -one, uh, especially if they are tier one type referrals or IEP based counseling, they are one-to-one, -one. but group does work. Um, they, there are virtual schools who, you know, all the kids are at home and so they would all just call into a virtual session. Uh, if those of you were working during the pandemic, many of them were using Google Classroom, um, calling in and all being on the same, same page, so to speak. So you could do group that way. Uh, turn taking is, is one of the kind of the basic, I'll use as an example. So you could use games, uh, videos, storybooks virtually. So group therapy does happen. Uh, virtually, and you would just link into a Zoom session. Um, School-based, sometimes it's a classroom. So let's say you have a self-contained classroom and you're teaching a lesson as a school counselor. You're teaching a, a basic friendship lesson uh, that would be facilitated by the teacher. They would put you on screen. Uh, most classrooms today are pretty tech savvy and have screens or um, uh, Promethean boards, and they would just show that as a class, and then the teacher would help facilitate any Q&A or turn-taking or physical activities. I hope that answers your question. Great, and we had some great um, suggestions there in the chat um, with those different asynchronous and synchronous activities, and Paula had put in um, the chat also a great um, place speed test on net where you can check your um, the bandwidth of your um, current internet. So we have our next test your knowledge question, and this is asynchronous sessions do not require scheduling and happen on your own time. True or false? You guys are just rocking these questions. A little hint, these are on your handout, and they you may also see them again um, on the post test. Good job. Yeah, awesome. Great job, everybody. Okay. So um, again, in talking about digital literacy, um, the American Library Association's Digital Literacy Task Force offers this de definition of digital literacy. Digital literacy is the ability to use information and communication technologies to find, evaluate, create, and communicate information requiring both cognitive and technical skills. So by definition, this is an individual's ability to use and understand the electronic and digital world. For many students today, they've been using digital devices since they were babies, you know, early childhood. And so they're very familiar with using technology to gather information, communicate, and create. But when beginning your virtual practice, it's important to have an idea of their digital liter literacy level. You wanna make sure um, and, and find out if they've been familiar with a computer or a tablet or a mouse. You know, a lot of students maybe have used trackpads or just the tablets. You wanna make sure that they can navigate those audio controls so that they can turn up the sound to hear you. And also is their um, assistant familiar with this, those settings and how to link to a session. So these are just a few things that you would wanna check for. Do they have basic computer skills such as familiarity functions of a laptop, computer, tablet, audio controls, USB port, webcam connectivity, and screen sharing? And is there familiarity with basic internet skills such as how to use a browser, how to access email, how to conduct a search, and safety protocols for spam and phishing? Because there's so much out there to click on that um, we want to make sure they're not getting into trouble with any of that. It's a good idea to set up an introductory session to complete a tech check and introduce yourself to the student. You wanna verify that the student can access the audio controls and adjust those accordingly. 
practice using headphones or a Bluetooth listening device and make sure that the sound is good. Practice sharing visual stim stimuli, ensuring that the student is viewing the item on a screen no smaller than about 9.7 inches, um, ideally, and that's per Pearson, a, a test publisher recommendation. By completing this introductory session, you can also determine if the student is a good candidate for teletherapy or um, if they have an understanding of tech support that may be needed by an e-helper or a facilitator. This will also provide you with a sense of their environment and any possible distractions that may be present. In the same way that you work with the student, it's also a good idea to conduct a prep session with the facilitator or parent. Determine if additional training or support is needed to access, again, those same things, webcam, headphones. You may need to suggest different seating arrangements for the student. Talk to the facilitator or parent about confidentiality and any expectations that you might have regarding the assessment, uh, an assessment session if you're going to be doing any evaluations. Um, this would also be a good opportunity to review any physical testing materials that may be needed during an assessment session, and also any physical materials that you might want to have around during your um, student sessions. So here's a question about um, digital literacy. Go back and find this one here. Okay. So go ahead and click on um, the answer there. Great. The results. So yeah, that's the answer. There is all of the above. We want to make sure that they can have a little knowledge of each of those questions. All right. Okay. So let's move into school-based versus home-based. So school-based services are those provided when the student is accessing the session through a school setting. Um, in the school setting, an e-helper or a facilitator is often made available with you at the school. And for students who are homeschooled, then your e-helper or facilitator is the primary caregiver. And when you're working with the facilitator, it's important to consider the digital literacy of that assistant and the student. Within the virtual environment, it's important to consider the tools needed for adapting the traditional hard copy forms to digital, as well as any therapy materials. When beginning therapy or an evaluation session for a student, parent consent is necessary to begin services. So for that legal documentation, such as a consent form, you'll need to utilize a, an electronic signature software versus a hard copy that you would normally use in person. If you're contracted with a local education agency or an LEA, they will often instruct you with their requirements. Otherwise, as a private practitioner, you'll want to consider using a program that can provide a certified electronic signature. And this secures the document against any alteration and that the certified digital signature is legally secure. For assessments that require the use of manipulatives during an in-person evaluation, you'll need to consult with the test publishers regarding virtual administration and the possible subtest substitutions. Many publishers are now providing updated assessments specifically meant for virtual administration. Um, many clinicians have embraced the use of creative technology resources to enhance their sessions, and they can use anything from virtual games to virtual playrooms and the, even the use of green screens. By utilizing and staying up to date with these creative resources, you can keep your students engaged and interested. And then lastly, one of the greatest benefits of teletherapy is the opportunity for parents and caregivers to participate. Virtual services allow for an increased parent engagement because they can remote in from anywhere. They don't have to have that travel time or require to take time off of work for meetings. And oftentimes parents or caregivers, they feel more at ease with the interview process done virtually, and they can often provide valuable insight on concerns within the home environment. 
So now we're going to move into evidence-based practice. Uh, we'll discuss uh, different things with, within this and then also have some of those test your knowledge questions at the end. So the American Speech Language Hearing Association, ASHA, defines evidence-based practice as a framework integrating external scientific evidence, clinical expertise, and client perspective to answer clinical questions and make informed decisions. ASHA's position states that the EBPs ensure high quality and individualized care. The American School Counselor Association, ASCA, defines evidence-based practice as professional wisdom combi combined with empirical evidence. Professional wisdom is the judgment clinicians have acquired through their experience. The EBP school counseling model is the integration of using data, using outcome research, and evaluating intervention and programming. So in a broader sense, evidence-based practice includes three parts, research evidence, client perspective, and clinical expertise. Developing clinical expertise is vital in all areas involving EBP, especially for teletherapy. Not all EBPs are effective in the teletherapy environment, so you will need to rely on your professional wisdom for the appropriateness of your therapy model. By remaining current in evidence-based practice within your clinician community and utilize research-based tools, you can enhance your clinical expertise. Lastly, an important piece of evidence-based practice is evaluating your practice by utilizing progress monitoring, pre- and post-assessments, and also goal development. Through a systematic scientific approach, you can assess if your therapy tools effectively meet your client's goals. So as I mentioned, we're gonna test our knowledge with a couple of different questions here. We've just got one choice for these. Evidence-based practice includes three parts, research evidence, client perspective, and, and you'll just fill in the blank here. And so that correct answer is clinical expertise. And then the second, uh, an important piece of evidence-based practice is evaluating your practice. You can do this by the, doing the following except. So the correct answer there, sending out evaluation forms to your students or clients. Doing awesome there. So these are uh, just some resources that contributed to the information that has been shared here today. These are listed on your participant worksheet as well. All right, so that brings us to the end of today's content. Let's review what we have gone over today. Um, you can take a minute to look back at the learning outcomes that we reviewed at the beginning of the workshop, but um, these are also in your handout as well. So we can now define three key terms related to teletherapy. We can describe two examples of synchronous versus asynchronous teletherapy methods. And we can summarize evidence-based practices for teletherapy. Next, you'll be invited to take a workshop survey, and one of these questions will ask you about how well this workshop has prepared you to achieve each of these three outcomes. As we wrap up, we want to make sure that we talk to you about our upcoming clinical services webinars. This is one of the questions that we had in the Q&A. These are the next four, uh, three in this series of four. So our next webinar um, will be over legal and ethical considerations of teletherapy. We will also be talking about those teletherapy strategies where we're going to go in depth into um, preparing, uh, documenting all the great things about those teletherapy strategies. And then the final webinar is a really deep dive into teletherapy sessions. 
So we're going to put a, a link into the chat um, with a link. This is the link to the course survey and that post test. Let me do this here. Okay. Um, go ahead and you can click on that link to access that. You'll complete the course evaluation first, and then the next session will be that post test. Your certificate of attendance will be emailed to you within 48 hours um, if you complete that post test. And if you do have any questions, you can email us at clinicalservices at elumatherapy.com. So while you're doing that, we'll go ahead and answer a few of these questions. Um, if there's any others that you have, I, can't, I think we did, we answered the questions about the next sessions. Um, we will be hosting the next um, webinar in late March or early April. Any other questions or thoughts, go ahead and put those in the chat. If you have any questions about completing that, um, Evaluation, please let us know. That's in the chat as well. So we're so excited that you were here with us today. Um, today we've provided you with the knowledge you need to understand teletherapy, including key terms, um, asynchronous versus synchronous, synchronous sessions and evidence-based practice. Remember, in order to receive your certificate for this workshop, you do need to complete the survey and answer the 10 questions on the post-test. So good luck with that and thank you. When you've completed that post-test, feel free to hop out of the webinar. Thank you everyone we will for also joining stick us. Yeah, we're so glad to have you here. We'll stick around for a few minutes if there are any other questions or thoughts um, that you have for us. Kathy, did you have a question? I see a raised hand here. You can type that in the chat. Access to the survey, is it letting you click on the link there? We'll stick that. Let's see. Let me double check that again to make sure that we. Should be on um, live. I'm able to access it yeah, there. I am too. It might be a pop up blocker, perhaps. Try this one more time. Here's another. Yeah, that works. So if you click this the link there in the chat, then that will take you to the course evaluation and, and examination. And it will look like this. Um, no. Oh, so currently um, for the, um, you, we will send you a certificate. And we are not a pre-approved pre provider for CEUs, but you can take all the information because we do have the post-test and you will receive a certificate. Um, you will be able to submit that um, on your own for CEUs, depending on your state or um, national license, uh, licensure and certification. If you need any other information from us, I know sometimes um, people will I know some states require like a brochure or speaker bios or something like that. We do have that information. Um, our speaker bio, bios are on that registration page, but we do have um, a brochure that we can send you if you need it. Um, if you do need something like that, then just email us at clinicalservices at elumatherapy.com. Um, yeah, Angela, I'll, we'll, um, 
we'll look for that link for you. All right, if you have any questions or any concerns, then um, please give us, give us a shout through email and we'll be happy to answer your questions. I think we're done with recording, right?